Welcome back to another episode of SAS Buyers Club. I'm your host, Omid. And I'm your co-host, Joe. And my name is Steve Nunn from Intista. It's a pleasure to meet you, Steve. Okay. You know, why don't we start off with you telling us a little bit about yourself and your business and what you guys do? Uh, well, me. Uh, I'm British. Uh, been living in America for 28 years now. Dual citizen. Cool. Cool. Um, <clears throat> What do I do? It's a big, just big. It's a short question with a long answer. Yeah. Um, so um, I own a company. I have a company called, uh, CEO of called Intista, um, and the name is, comes from Integration and Fashionista combined. So we are integration specialists. In integration is the integration of acquired businesses, and we specialize in what's called the lower mid and mid-sized market size. So where the acquired business has less than 1,000 employees. In our industry, the size of the acquirer doesn't affect if we're engaged or not. It's really about the size of the acquired business. Um, my background, I am I'm a glorified, I'm a, I'm a jack of all trades to the extreme. I have done many different careers, which has helped me be able to, talk to people in different languages. I started life as a civil engineer, went into mm. architectural software, then HVAC software, uh, oh. and then uh, then went to, I was living in Australia then, and then I moved back to England, went into civil engineering software and did the IT industry, apprenticeship as I call it. So software design, coding, coding team leader, tech support, the whole, Anyone in the IT industry has done that kind of apprenticeship. Everyone's earned their stripes doing some tech support. Mm. Uh, yeah. I've done that too. Okay. And uh, then I moved to, uh, our software was sold all over the world. I moved to the American channel partners, people were selling the product across America. Mm. And two weeks after I moved to Boston, they started to acquire the company I, I left in England. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Interesting. It took about a year and a half to go through. And then so the smaller company I moved to with 10 people or so bought the 100 person company I used to work for in England. Hmm. And my first exposure to M&A. And um, a few years later, we got acquired by an American company called Bentley Systems, who owned the engineering software market, the global engineering software market. So any road you've driven on pretty much any power you've had you've used has been uh, any water you've drunk any railway you've been on the software probably came from bentley systems and that's anywhere in the world pretty much um, they're not strong in as uh, strong in architecture that's dominated by autodesk and revit and all those people that I know um and i could tell you i could talk to you about my experience of being uh, acquired uh, in another question we would yeah, um, we would yeah definitely the, we can do a deeper dive and follow up on that because that's usually one of the things we talk about is when people have had an, uh, an acquisition or been part of an acquisition, we ask all sorts of deeper questions there about like things you would have learned or issues, maybe fires you saw, if you're willing to mention them here publicly and if you're not bound by a confidentiality, stuff like that. We love to talk about that because our audience being uh, first time sellers very frequently, founders, private equity buyers, with that type of audience, uh, those lessons learned from personal experiences from experts are super valuable. Well, do you want to tell you a little no, bit? No, no, we'll get to that, but let's throw it, I'm actually enjoying your story of telling us okay. Okay. The, more of like a historical uh, yeah. background actually, so please keep going. So we got acquired by Bentley, and uh, before I got acquired, and I was I was a minority owner of the company. Um, the company was called Infrasoft, Infrastructure Software, uh, Infrasoft, and we got acquired. I can't remember how long ago it was. Oh, I do know. It was when my son was born, so it was twenty years ago, and um, uh, I had been doing many different things, pretty much running everything post sales, so tech support, consulting keeping customers. And I didn't really have a good spot to fit in. I ended up being demoted to project manager. Mm. And then 
obviously I recognized what I did. I got moved up to program manager and then I was running these um, global programs for training material created all over the world. It was really hard organizing these teams. They just weren't working well together. I was like, why is it that? And then then the, the light bulb went on. Oh, they'd been acquired and they were integrated. Mm. Yes. And Please you, go ahead. You've heard this story before from somebody else, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I approached the COO and said, you know, like, you should create a job for someone to integrate your acquisitions. And he said, Steve, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> That's funny. And uh, at the same time, somebody else had also approached the CEO and said, hey, you should organize how you acquire companies. Mm. Um, I didn't know this person at the time. They end up forming a team where this other person, John, formed the buy side, formed the acquiring team, and then I was part of the integration team. We worked together, and uh, I think we did. I did five years in the company uh, as employee. I think we did about five a year. No, I did eighteen or something in five years. Oh, Small that's. Long. They bought a lot of businesses. Oh, That's quite a lot of integrations that you did there. Uh, yes, it was. And um, there was a journey of learning there. Oh, um, God. That's, I wasn't that's very, definitely, looking that's, back, I wasn't at all very good at it, but I was the best they ever had at that stage. Um, and um, uh, by they make a huge difference. Um, I probably brought on 600 people into a 3,000-person company, so I knew a lot of people. Um, and it was, I loved the job. Um, anyway, uh, times changed and I left the company and I went independent and became a contractor, uh, doing pretty much one job a, a year, one bigger job a year. Um, but I saw this, this thing for training and I started writing a book about how to integrate acquired businesses, small businesses, which are different to acquiring a large business, how to integrate, so how to integrate acquire small businesses, not acquire them. And my notes started turning into training material. It's just, oh, but I know tech, I know training, I know LMSs. And so I thought, you know what, there's probably a market need for this. No one's really teaching integration training online. Is it all in classroom? And so uh, I had, 2018 was a good year. And so with the with the wife's blessing, I took 2019 to not seek any business, but to bring <laughs> the product to market. Now, of course, you need the boss's opinion, you know, sign off to <laughs> do that. So she said, yes, okay, let's do it. You, you know, if you don't, and she was very supportive. She said, if you don't try, you'll always regret. What if, what if? So it took a little bit longer. I And I eventually brought to market in February 2020. I changed my business model from contracting to consulting mm. just in time for COVID. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, and consulting is a different business model. So now instead of seeking one integration per year, you work full tilt, 50, 60 hours a week, uh, a week and then you, you've got no bandwidth to do anything else. Then you move and you, uh, the job finishes after six, nine months, and then you start from scratch, building a network up and finding out the next engagement. Now we're talking about 10 to 20 hours a week with a, a, a client and a team of people, mm. and the engagements overlap. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did that was because I wanted, I, I needed bandwidth to to get this training to market. It's, it's, it, ended up, it actually ended up becoming a certification program, which I launched uh, last year, I think it was. Okay. And uh, so that's where I am. I, I went from being a lone ranger to having a, a team of people who work for me, um, spread across the, the world, um, and they're experts in their particular fields. Some are experts in integration, some no integration. And uh, between us, we deliver for our clients. That's a short version. No, that's, that's great. I have, I have a lot of follow-up questions just to to dive into that. Um, but please, was there anything you wanted to add before uh, we ask you some follow-up questions? I've, I've, I've done lots of different roles in different companies. 
So in a startup in Boston, I was doing sales, sales support. Um, you know, I learned all these different things. I, when I was working for Bentley, I was assigned to HR. So I learned mm. HR, HR project management. And I was switched to the finance team. Uh, they couldn't find a home for me, so I was switched to finance. So I learned about that. I get to learn the language of these different um, departments, which was very helpful later on. Mm. Mm. I see, I see. Oh, Mira, I don't want to hog the mic, but let me ask a question on the tip of my tongue. Does that sound good for you? Okay, cool. I'll throw it out and I'll let Omid talk, and then I, I have some other questions too. My my next question is is really that. So it sounds like for your consultancy business, people who are acquiring businesses would reach out to you for integration consultancy. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Um, we are usually we should be hired during the due diligence phase of an acquisition. We're hired. Oh. We're hired on by the by the acquirer. The buy side uh, hires us. Uh, the, when to engage uh, the integration team? The research has shown the earlier you engage them, the better chances of success there are. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, as a cost benefit, uh, if you're going to obviously, I'm independent, so you, hiring me costs you money as opposed to having employees. If you have employees. Uh, then you would probably bring them in really early to get involved to help the deal team make good decisions in in uh, assessing the price to pay for a business. We could talk about that as well. Um, okay. No, I see. I, I want to ask real quick. So that makes a lot of sense. I get that. And I, I feel where you're coming from about time there. You mentioned earlier that you focus on lower to mid market uh, m and transactions. Within that uh, scope, are there any specific businesses? You know, you come with that international experience too. So, do you do you do cross border integrations particularly? How about like a little bit more information on who you particularly service? Um, so we are industry agnostic because uh, the people who are in the businesses know their business the best. Um, okay. What we know is how to. Um, how to organize, prioritize, how to ask the right questions, how to avoid mistakes in rework, things right. being done out of sequence, um, how to, a big thing with low, mid and mid is, is, you're, is you're buying a company pretty much not for what it is right now, but what it will be in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're buying for future potential. So that potential is really tied to the employees of the acquired company. So a focus area for our, or my, my company and perhaps your, your clients too, is, is staff retention, staff onboarding, um, to make sure that they up to speed quickly with the new way of working, new environment, perhaps even new culture, um, and, um, and, and get the business humming. Um, staff retention is, retention is a big thing. Uh, to the extent that I recommend acquirers let nobody go, um, that the, um, the 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 what appears to be a cost saving in letting, say, the receptionist go or an invoicing person go, can uh, uh, affect morale of the people left behind, and that will morale affects engagement, engagement affects productivity, and that affects hitting milestones. Um, the and so. That's a big deal we harp on, and I love that you mention it as an expert integration consultant, because we talk about that, you know, M&A lawyers aren't always involved in post-merger or post-acquisition integration. It's on a transaction by transaction thing. So it's, it's you know, maybe like a small percentage of our transactions do we do that, but it is something we harp on. And uh, it's easy for people to look at the numbers and say, oh, there's cost cutting advantages. This business is actually more profitable. The owner just wasn't doing the, these tricks. And hey, but at the end of the day, there's things that aren't quantitative. So I love right. that you call that out. And we can get more into those details, but for now, just on uh, oh, yeah. about new service. And do you service companies that are usually small uh, in from an employee count, like 10 to 50, one to a hundred. What's that okay. like? So the, the, we say under a thousand employees need quite a company. Um, and like, uh, and the engagement varies dramatically. 
uh, I did a four person company in Louisiana buying a 20 person company. It was oh. pretty much a few hours work, but you know, on the other hand, I did this, um, seven country, uh, integration. I did the IT work stream only with this one. I was a subcontractor doing the IT integration of a, of a medical device company, uh, American Chinese company buying a German company manufacturing in Ireland. And it's about three, 400 people, um, did a, one in Atlanta that had uh, a $2 billion deal, 700 person company buying an 800 person company in mm -hmm. Utah. Um, so the, and of course, the bigger the company, the longer, the more engaged we were. The, the one in Atlanta, there were two of us working on that. Um, the one in China, Germany, there were five of us working on that, actually. Okay. Um, I see, yeah. I see. Now that makes sense. So it's anything under a thousand, mm. but you know, it sounds like usually not necessarily like sub five person targets. It's probably like just above the, there's probably like a, a, a threshold there, a floor. Yeah, so the the middle of the bell curve are really where the acquired companies got between, say, uh, say, say, fifty people and and three hundred people, perhaps. Uh, that's the middle of where we are. Um, but really, um, there's a point where you don't need us. If you buy a, a, a paint or a pool company, it's very simple. You merge your QuickBooks together and you you mm -hmm. send some flyers out and you're, you're done. Um, but when you get a company with teams. Teams have different priorities they work on, and the sometimes conflict and resolving these conflicts and priorities is where we start to give value. So as soon as you start having a company with teams, that's where we can be engaged. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense. And actually, you know, we had talked a little bit before the show that we're wondering, hey, what can we talk about? But actually, I have so many, uh, maybe it's just because we're M&A people. I already have so many questions. But let me go ahead and throw it over to you, Amin. <clears throat> Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a, a topic that we talk about so often. You know, um, everyone always focuses on, uh, especially in the lower middle market, the dying of deals. You know, like, oh, like, uh, these people kill deals or, you know, like, the concern so much in the lower middle market is just the closing of the deal. Whereas like most of the other, you know, mar the middle market, so on and so forth. It's actually really about the deals dying, uh, post acquisition, post merger or That's not where results. Yeah, exactly. Which in, it in, in, in essence is, yeah. I mean, if you're not hitting the, the results that you want, that's not good. So it eventually is like, it's headed down the wrong path. So, um, so, um, so I'd love to learn, Steve, you know, to just jump into the meat and potatoes of the conversation. Let's pretend, you know, we're an acquirer and, you know, we're, we want to hire you. We're in the due diligence phase. What does that, what does it look like from there? Like, let's say we've signed your engagement and, and you're coming in, we're acquiring a company, um, just as a hypothetical, what are kind of the steps that you walk through? Okay. So um, typically we're hired towards the end of due diligence. Um, the, um, when the deal team says, you know, this looks pretty good. We think it's going to happen. It's worth thinking about integration now. Um, mm -hmm. And that's generally the best value for money. Um, hell, I would love to be involved earlier, but let's, let's, get, let's be practical here. Um, when it's going to happen, then you should get the deal team, the integration team in. And we get access to due diligence, but, but we look at it a different way to the deal team. Deal team is looking for what well, you know what you're looking for. You know, is are they legitimate? Um, are they telling the truth? You know, um, can can we model? Let's model the business future. Um, so we look at it like where are the differences? So where are the big differences between the acquiring and acquire business? Um, yeah. If they're both humming or both dysfunctional, that you will integrate quite well together. But if they're different, that's a problem. Mm. Uh, and it does seem strange to say dysfunctional teams uh, can be integrated well, but but um, 
Yeah, that definitely made me raise an eyebrow. Like, yeah. interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, say more. Say more. It's and the vision I have in my head is really chaotic teams. Um, mm. the, the, that's not so much uh, personality dysfunction. That is a big issue, uh, which we can do a whole talk about people. Um, but um, you're overcoming the big objective with acquiring low, mid, and mid is getting trust. Getting trust. Okay. Because if you right. get people's mm. trust, they believe in the mission, the reason why you bought them. They believe what we try and do. They believe we've got a future together. They believe their job's safe. They believe their mm. company's safe, the product's safe. And they won't spend so much time at the water cooler or the kitchen talking about things. They're back mm. at their desk doing their thing. We okay. trust they'll weather the storm, the turbulence that's about to hit them with the integration. Mm. You know, um, if people know why you're going on a crappy journey, but they know why you're going on it, they know where you're going. And you've got to get the mm. trust through that. Wait, quick question. So step one. Go ahead, oh, Joe. Go, I'll, go ahead, Omid. Then I'll ask my quick question. No, no, ask your quick question. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. You know, I, I wanted to keep hearing about the steps and what you were saying, but quick question there, because I saw uh, something that confused me was, okay, you want to build trust, you know, post acquisition. You don't want people thinking, oh, I'm going to lose my job or, oh, you know, is my pay going to get cut or are they going to refocus or product something? But isn't that something you'd want to do pre closing? Like you'd want to get in there. I'm not, I'm not insisting on this. I'm just thinking like, when do you start your messaging on that? Is it like at the time yeah. of closing? Okay. So I, I start with the middle part, the trust of the announcement. And after that, because to get that, to get to the point of trust, how do you establish trust? So let's go, let's go backwards. This is time. my question. <laughs> this is, this is my question. You're nailing uh, it, Steve. My, Perfect. Where mine melded. So yeah. to, this is a long way of answering that steps question. Because the journey you're going is day one, <clears throat> excuse me, is day one announcement. How do we start earning trust? How do we get something in the trust? Okay. okay. So to do that before that, well, at the announcement, you're going to say, well, to the company, we have a great future together. Here's the grand vision for the product, uh, the office space, the pantry, wherever you're working. Um, but to do that, you've got to be, and it's got to be credible. You can say occasionally, I'm not sure about the answer here, but you've got to have a, a you know a, a pretty clear, high level vision of what you're going to do, and you can't do that off the cuff. Mm. So, how do you do that? So, we go back to the steps. Join due diligence. Now we're looking at the at the at the, 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 the 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 vault, and we're going, okay, okay. I understand the buildings. I understand the employees. They buy pizza on Fridays. Um, I understand the tools they're using. So we go to the deal team and we say, and we beg you guys, you guys, I mean, you deal team people work really intensely. Us integration people work a long, long and hard, but you, you guys, you, you ask, you go to crazy people and you stop. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was going yeah, mm -hmm. off the cliff. But for us, integration, we work long and high, but not as high as you. Anyway, mm. we beg for your time. We beg, give me half an hour, please. Oh, I'm too busy, Steve. No, please, I need to know why you're buying the company. We get that half hour, hopefully, a one hour meeting and say, why are you buying the company? What do you want to do with it? What's your vision that we have to deliver so that when you guys are waving goodbye with a, whatever bonuses you've got, we have to deliver what you've dreamt up. Tell us what you want to do. So say, oh, we want to, you know, we want to combine us to wet SAS. We want to, um, embed the, the your application into our platform product and okay so what do you is that how do you want to do this you know have you got some way of doing it well and we you know i can't try to think as to go along here but um um and we want to do it by oh and we want to do it in german so oh. so okay so <laughs> it's like the acquired company is in german and we're in english only uh, we want to learn, and so so we'll do that as well. Okay. Okay. So then we go. So the integration team goes. Okay. How do we do this? How do we how do we merge these together? And how, so this company they're acquiring does does uh, what we call localization. 
So they modify the product depending on the language of the receive of the of the client. So and it's localization is more than just language. It might be files they don't allow and things like that. Mm. So they got so um, a skill in. So they got some skills here. That's great, great. Oh, no, okay. So, but how do we do this? So we work out well. How are you going to do? How are we going to do uh, combined technologies? How are we going to do payroll? How are we going to do um, uh, intellectual property? And we start creating problems for ourselves to solve. So we only had a half hour conversation from the deal team, but now we're thinking about okay, how do we actually do that? Okay, mm -hmm. we need a work stream for finance. We need a work stream for for server, and a work stream for 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 clients for mobile. Where some companies might need only one work stream for IT. You've got you've got an, a work stream for a, for infrastructure, IT infrastructure, a work stream for server, a work stream for for clients mobile. So we work out what we need to do to uh, what work streams we need. Right. Who, Okay, so we're doing marketing. And the marketing's got to have an understanding of foreign markets. So we can't choose Joe. Sorry, I didn't mean, I didn't mean Joe. We can't use oh, Fred. I don't mind. <laughs> we got to use Jane, because Jane's got experience in foreign markets. So she's going to lead marketing. So you choose the right person to solve the problem you've got to solve for integration, to lead mm. the work streams. Not just the head of marketing. Somebody, because... Obviously, it's going to take. You had to devote time to this. You got to devote. So it sounds like you identify like all of the different areas that need integration. You know these different work streams, and then you identify a point person who's going to be responsible for those work streams. Is that accurate so far? That's right, and they have to have okay. the capability and the bandwidth to do this. Okay, I've done integrations where the perfect person was just too busy couldn't devote more than five percent uh, of his time to it like sorry i i can't do 30 percent. i can do five percent okay we'll find somebody else not to cut you off or anything but to connect the dots so you're basically saying here that there's that announcement is the first touch point for engagement with the target and their employees regarding the the integration and the works related to it but there's just a lot of planning that goes into that in advance yes yes okay Okay, and I the, get it. And the planning that goes into that in advance to the announcement is understanding why the acquirer is acquiring the target and then identifying the work streams that are necessary for the acquisition to be integrated and then identifying uh, point people for each of those work streams that can oversee the integration of those work streams. Accurate? Uh, that's part of it. Yes. So far, okay. yeah. Okay. Go on, please. <laughs> okay, cool. Cool. So there, there is um, there's a lot going on. Um, I used to be a project manager, and project management in America is uh, a different philosophy to the UK. It, project management in America is much more plan it really well before you start, and it pretty much runs itself, which I subscribe to. Um, I'm not going to bash the Brits, they're okay in their own way. But my integration, I, I developed a, a, an approach to integrating smaller businesses. Um, that's five steps. And the five steps are uh, what I call the small business, simple integration method, the SIM. And it's, uh, the, the first step is find out the reasons for acquiring. The second is work out the objectives. What are you trying to achieve and by when? Third is high level planning. So the work streams, who's going to lead them, the tools and things. Then the kickoff, which in the middle of the kickoff is the announcement, but you've got preparing for the announcement and then you've got create, creating the detailed projects to do. So the announcements in the middle of the kickoff in, in my process. And the fifth one is execution and reporting. Each step gets longer and longer. The first one is an, uh, the hour long meeting I talked about. At the far end, execution and reporting would be between six and 12 months, 18 months if you've got a big IT stack. Mm. This is why you were saying the deal team works like fast and hard, whereas like you guys work, you know, kind of more of a slow burn over a longer period of time because we're like putting yeah. the deal together. 
yeah. and then you come in and have to like, you know, yeah, kind of in a way we're kind out. of. I got a graph somewhere, but we're kind of like a standard deviation curve. It's kind of slightly leaning towards the um, uh, towards the the, the the announcement. But yeah, it's, you guys are like a freaking cliff that drops off and bye, we're going now. Yeah, see you later. Nobody we're, talks to us. We'll lie down in a quiet room for a while. <laughs> uh, exactly. Okay, now, please go on. Uh, and I'm, I'm just to, just to touch base with you. This is all great content. I'm liking the direction this is going. Very helpful. As you can imagine, for example, a first time seller would love to know that their employees are in good hands and that there's a process for it. And most people, when they learn about M&A, if they're not already professionals, don't usually learn about integration. It's kind of one of those. It's like they oh, learn the hard learn, way. <laughs> they learn. the. It's not the most exciting thing. It's like, oh, it sounds like a lot of work. I want to do forecasts of marketing product plans and stuff. That's where people get excited. But anyway, so just to give you a little background of what I think of the conversation so far. It's not glamorous work, but uh, and it's frustrating. It's <laughs> annoying at times. Um, but I'm at our end of the market. It's also not it's not going to make you rich, but it's very rewarding. Personally, I'm really a people advocate, a people person. I love helping people out. And um, it's it's a it's a rewarding in non financial ways. Well, I get paid, of course. Um, uh, <laughs> but yeah. but um, you know, um, sometimes other jobs will have, be well paid for people in somewhere in the world, and they don't like their job. But I love I like my job. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, Steve, where do people go wrong with integration? Where do people right. go wrong? <laughs> Do that. That's going to be a big topic, though. I wanted. I wanted to ask real quick. Yeah, yeah. We'll get a okay, hold go ahead, you. Joe. What's, what's your website? How do people get a hold of you normally? And maybe your email. You could just spit out your email address if it's speakable. So the company is called Intista. So the company the website is called is intista.com. I N T I S T A. And my personal email address at the risk Fair of work email. I mean. Whoever yeah, the marketing sorry. email is that people are supposed to message. Okay, so um, should I give my my actual direct email address? Whoever new clients message. Uh, That's me at the moment. Okay, okay so <laughs> yeah. all right, so and my email address is steve at intista.com. Great. We don't really ask that a little earlier. Maybe we'll even chop it up. Uh, I just wanted to make sure because we like to say up front who you are, what you do. This is how people get a hold of you. So I wanted to check our box there. Oh, me back to you, man. Sorry. You know, I don't need to cut you off. No worries, man. All good. Yeah, Steve, where do people go wrong? Tell us where people go wrong with the inner. So we heard the five step process, right? So you just gave us the five step process. Where do people go wrong? What do they do? Oh, my goodness. Um, so many things. It sounds like there's a lot of things. <laughs> There's so many different ways. It's, it's a snowflake question, really. Um, every business is unique, and now you're combining two unique businesses, and you get a very unique integration. But there are some common things. And one thing is leadership of the acquired company. They have worked really hard getting the company acquired and selling leaders too, sell side. They've worked particularly hard trying to keep it a secret trying to run the business and trying to get this done. And, um, and the acquiring leadership comes in and they nail the, the welcome speech. It goes really, really well. I think, oh, thank God for that. I can go back to my, my, day, my day job now. And they're gone. And the job's not finished. Uh, the, now, these leaders, I understand their perspective. They put a lot of projects off because of the work to do the acquisition. But... They spent a lot of money on the deal on the company too. It's time to get the value out of it. Mm. And I need leaders. We, as an industry, we need leaders to be around now and then. And the integration manager office, the IMO, will prep. A good IMO will prep the leader with like like a politician come in. Here's your speech, here's your talking points. Off you go. We a good IMO will do this for leaders. Come into the office in. Pittsburgh, here's what you got to say. Spend half a day there, meet these people, get the rah-rah 
for everyone and because it's you know times are tough at the moment the morale is low we need to come in and and help us out so um leadership going uh being unavailable not going out well but being unavailable is is a really big problem because because you know morale it's it's tough there's a honeymoon period where you're oh it's the future is exciting it's been great and mm -hmm. then you go oh now i've got to merge together invoicing <laughs> oh Oh my God! I got to go home. I got a kid in daycare. I want to go. Oh God. Yeah. And and then you know and then oh it's so hard. They're not. And I email the other side. They're not helping me out here. It's morale and morale drops down. Uh, and that's and so you always have a dip in morale and productivity goes down, especially in acquired smaller businesses. Put put pin in that one for a second. Uh -huh. We need leaders to be able to come out here and and do a you know. We love you speech. Keep going. We're, we're with you. Help us out. You know, here's what we're trying to do. That'd be very, very helpful indeed. That would be a really, would really help integrations tremendously. Okay. Well, another mistake we make. Um, well, by the way, on that, so I, there was really another part too, which was something you touched on earlier, which was just ensuring that the management of the integration fits in with people's bandwidth and their priorities and has right has leaders sub leaders too, correctly carrying the process forward because as so often happens and as you've pointed out when people have already their present job and then also have to now i have to learn a new tool that they use or now i'm switching over my processes that is a second job um and it can take longer and that really goes back to that planning stage where you can't just assume all the employees are going to just do everything you want to do in addition to their current job. You have to allocate bandwidth and leadership also beyond just the, the head leaders. Absolutely right. Deal team almost always has people who are really vested in it happening. They're excited mm -hmm. about it and uh, they want it to happen. And, uh, maybe they compensate maybe they just want a bigger business a better business but when you integration involves people people who usually didn't know about the acquisition people who you know hey we made a specialist mobile app that does this thing and now i've been bought by acme platform software services.com and i only part of them I want to be part of the old company. I didn't choose that. I said, I got a kid in daycare. I'm going home at five o'clock. I don't want to put extra hours in for you. I mm -hmm. didn't choose to get acquired. Um, and these are, you know, like, and this is, there's a lot, a lot of you know, good angles here, but it is also um, for leaders. It's a good time to see who rises the occasion to, uh, at, because um, sometimes uh, there's people who just, I've seen it many times actually. Somebody you didn't really know, and then suddenly, like they've managed to merge together the HRIS system, or they managed to get all the part numbers consolidated into CRM, you know, in in two weeks, and and like, who are you? This is wonderful. And then this girl gets gets the you know, um, she rise, she gets promoted to team leader because she's you know, she, it's an opportunity to shine for employees too. And and you need middle management to recognise who's good performance or who's right, who's and then leadership to the middle management about all that what's going on there. Um, okay, okay, but you can please continue on. Oh God, uh, so mistake, mistake, mistakes. And just to <laughs> summarise and and kind of recap where we've been. So the first place that um, things go wrong often or is one of the one of the yeah one of um leadership of the uh, of the acquirer fails to continue to show up for the acquisition so they might you know give like a really lovely uh uh you know hey you, you know we're here this is you know we're so glad that you're that that we've been been able to acquire you so on and so forth but then after that like leadership's continued presence dwindles and so on and so forth and that's felt by the target company that's been acquired and as a result you know as we mentioned 
uh, morale falls typically irrespective of whether you nail the acquisition or not, but it's so important for leadership to continue to show up for that target company to ensure that morale stays as high as possible for the integration of that acquisition. Is that correct? Well done. It seems so Thank simple. <laughs> Especially if you get a supportive IMO, which can pretty much give the leadership, hey, turn up, here's the speaking points, shake someone's hand, meet this person here, this important team leader, we don't want to leave. You know, yeah. I, I hear it. It does seem so simple to me, but also, you know, these are people who, uh, as Steve has mentioned, have very busy schedules and they might think, oh, it's my manager's job. And I can understand where it's overlooked. Now, Steve, uh, give us another another example of where shit has hit the fan. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> commonplace problem we've is um, acquirers underestimate the cost of integrations. Um, okay. okay. So. Um, um, yeah. The um, here's a common thing, especially in IT. So you're selling a company. It's a two to three year journey of mentally getting ready to sell a company, and then you 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 go through it and you sell the and you achieve this. You had the choices while you were the owner of the company to invest in capital expenditure, to invest in new servers, in new hardware, new routers, bigger contracts, resurface the car park. Would you do that and you sell the company? Like, mm -hmm. if you don't spend that money, you've got more cash in your checking account and your value of the company is higher. Mm. So, acquirers, rookie acquirers, are almost shocked at the price of CapEx they need to spend. Mm. Oh. Yes, they are. It's not We've seen that. It's not reflected in the last one, two years of any of the financial statements and a lot of people you know look at the last three to it depends on the transaction and who it is but it might not necessarily be something that they also caught by looking and comparing the recent financials yeah. or understanding the, the industry itself i mean where in due diligence to say have you got a leaky roof <laughs> yeah. uh, well actually you know property inspection Oh, okay. okay. The lawyer answered your question. Sorry. <laughs> Good job. Well done. <laughs> but you're exactly right. Like, where does it go? Where in due diligence does maybe somebody who's not familiar with the target industry say, have you guys bought, back to your example, really, bought this, the XYZ new server, which is totally necessary for these security reasons or something. And it's such a fast pacing, fast pacing, fast pace security landscapes shit like that i don't know just throwing an example out there the there's very little data on the cost of integrations uh, especially smaller integrations people just don't want to tell you how much they do or don't don't want to uh, do or don't spend people don't tell you the cost of how much they spent on an integration uh, sometimes mm -hmm. yeah you know. so um there are a couple of papers out there by ey ernst and young they're getting old now. They're nine years old, eight years old. Um, but the nine-year-old one tells you that the average cost of integration all in is about 14% of the deal price. 14%. Oh. Mm. Now, now, it was That's a, a great fact. Yeah, 14%. So if you're spending 10 million, mm -hmm. you got to look at about 1.4. You've got a budget before contingency, before emergencies. So you got a budget about one and a half million on integration. Just for clarity there, that, that is a great fact, uh, Omid. And uh, just for clarity there, is that 14% like costs or expenses that were not previously forecast that arise in the following year or two years? Or is there a time frame and or is it inclusive of the cost of advisors for integration? If you don't have any more details off the top of your tongue, that's fine. I just wanted to ask. I don't. And EY didn't share the, the details of that. Okay. Uh, I would love to have the detail. I would love to have more data. If anybody out there has data, integration costs, please hand it to me. I owe you in advance. 
That's cool. That's cool. Do. No, no, I, do. I'll gather it up and I'll publish it if I get enough information. It sounds like I you think uh, there might be. Yeah, that's what I, I was literally just going to say that, Joe. Like what you were you just going to say, I was just going to say. <laughs> it sounds like there's an opportunity for you there, Steve, to compile that report and yeah, to to put the report out in terms of Was that what you were going to say, Joe? Yeah, I was I was going to say in different words as we do, but I was going to say that it sounds like you're well placed to provide that data. Um, because of, you know, your experience, maybe not the hugest data set, but definitely not an irrelevant data set at all. It, it, yes. And it's even when I'm involved in integrations, it's, it's, um, I'm not, I don't get to share with me. You know, I don't, I don't, um, I don't, find that, it. I don't share I, it. that would be like, an, I get it. Like it wouldn't necessarily be within your scope of works to yeah. like analyze or receive. Mm -hmm. all that data i get it so this is a big thing though like one thing i always i like to i like to take the hope out of people but <laughs> so a lot of people are very excited and hopeful about meeting certain targets or acquisitions going well it's like in our law firm is called optimist legal which isn't very fitting for what i'm about to say uh, and i make that comment pretty often uh, it's that you know in financial forecasts being optimistic is not necessarily the way to go definitely there needs to be multiple plans uh, I'm, a, I'm i'm a very conservative when it comes to a very conservative person when it comes to forecasting and usually i'm one of those people that always has a worst case scenario financial plan which i base my plans on uh and in terms of acquisitions I'm really just trying to comment on something you're you're raising here now. <clears throat> uh, sorry, I'll cough. Uh, in terms of acquisitions, there are you know significant costs associated with uh, or after closing that not everybody has in mind, and they're they're usually just in that rosy mindset, like you said earlier. Whatever we want to call it, the honeymoon period, or just ex plain old excitement. That data, what I do know about the data from EY was the data was very. Um, very flat curve. It varied from two percent to thirty percent. Oh, so yeah. it's, it's crazy, crazy. But when I combine it with the data from the eight-year-old uh, paper, which was talking about multi-billion-dollar deals and the cost integrations, and the cost was about sort of five percent, seven percent of of the deal value when you're buying a spending a billion dollars, mm. and you plot, I plot it on a on a curve, a log curve. And I, I drew it back to where I, I work, which is the sub 100 million deals. Um, and the, it was a line saying the cost goes up, the, 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 mm. the lower the valuation. And yeah. that makes sense. If you're going to fly from A to B, no matter what size the acquisition is, it's the same price of the plane ticket. Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, place from which to look at it. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it does make sense. I, um, so I, I actually, if I get a, a voice, I recommend uh, budgeting 20% instead of 14%. So you have a little safety net there. And then I also, if I'm really asked for it, I also ask for a contingency, which no one can touch and can't budget. And actually it'll say 10% there. Um, just in case things go wrong, um, things do go wrong. How long would you say to hold on to that contingency for? Mm -hmm. Say nothing happened in six months. Do you, would you advise if it was your choice to say hold on to it for eighteen months? No, I think you. I think six months is wise. I think you. Okay. You'll have a good idea of of what trouble there is. <laughs> okay. You no, know, you can get most of the. Uh, integration done in quite short order okay. um you know payroll invoicing um network consolidation so by six months if we say if there ever was an average integration you can get probably perhaps three quarters of the integration done in six months if there was such a thing as an average integration mm -hmm. but especially with technology technology stacks and it takes a long time to merge them together you can look at 18 months for to merge to the final few tasks. I, it just almost curves, it tapers off. And um, 
I tend to declare integration is complete when I get hit. It's all 96, 97 percent of tasks done. That's enough. You, you got it from here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. And from a, a capital perspective, you're saying here that you would say, hey, have this reserve, whether it's in a, another account or something. Where usually do you advise or do typically buyers get that capital from? Do they include it in how much they raise in debt? Do they include it in their working capital forecast? Is, do you, can you provide any specifics on what you typically see there? I have no idea, Joe, at all. I have no idea where the money comes from. I you said, mm. get, pull that money out if you, you might need it. I, we all have a job to do. And I need, you know, just <laughs> oh, um, do it, you know. Um, I, I can't my name. I work for. I should say I do. I do. I can't name names, but I did work for a, a company. No, I, work, I had a client who did not want to know the cost at all. Don't tell me the cost. Huh? Just like you can go there three times. Everything else is done remotely. I don't want to know the cost. That's it. I, I don't know, that's kind of odd. Yeah, that's that is odd. What is that? He's like, I don't want to know. It's denial is what it is. <laughs> yeah, but, but wow. Okay, interesting. How did that work out for? Did it work out? I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, he probably okay. just didn't. He was like, I don't want to know. I don't know. Especially in yeah. today's world where we where we do so much remotely. I mean, look at the three of us. We're nowhere near each other physically. Okay. You do so much. Um, but you just can't beat a handshake. It. You can, it, it, it accelerates the relationship forming. I wouldn't say you, you and I can have a relationship. We may never actually shake hands in our lives, and it will take longer to form a relationship than if we shake hands and have a beer together, you know, mm. or a cup of tea. Especially the beer part. <laughs> I've switched to tea in case you're a teetotaler. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still uh, oh, I was going to make fun of England as we do in America. Which part yeah. of England were you from? So, I, I'm from London. I thought uh, you were from London. I could tell because yeah. I lived there for a bit. I, I have a claim to fame uh, that I grew up next to Wembley Stadium. Oh, okay. So in my high school, we didn't work at the supermarket. We worked at, at Wembley Stadium. Oh, and that's funny. So I worked at Live cool. Aid. I was paid to go to Live Aid. Oh, that's cool. So that must have been fun, though. You probably got to go to a lot of events and stuff all the time. Oh, yeah. All the it was 80s. I did a lot of 80s pop stars. I was very, uh, I paid to go and see, very, very lucky. Child oh, really? That's legit. Well, you said pop yeah, that star. Sounds fun. That, that, that's inclusive of, in like American terminology, I don't know if I'm going out on a limb here, that's inclusive of rock stars. Well, I mean, I, that's what I assume. Oh, like Guns America, N' Roses, White Snake, you know, like uh, I, Madonna. I, like, I think there's a little linguistic difference there because in America, if you said pop stars, I'd be like, no, no. I mean, like, I saw Elton John 10 times, Duran ah, Duran, oh, no, that's the game, yeah. Tom the Twins. I saw Wham. Oh, Wham. Now, they're so Wham did the sound check for me. There was me and three other people in a Wembley Arena, and we, we our stall was ready. We were sitting around mm. watching the sound check, and George Michael's there getting ready for the sound check, and he's singing to me and two other people. Doing that's, a that's super cool. Oh, that's epic. You got to, oh man, I haven't been to that many. I've, I've only been to a handful of concerts. Yeah. Uh, that's probably the coolest thing ever. A uh, little bit jelly, but mm. I thought I'd ask real quick because uh, I don't know. I felt really uh, talking about meeting people a moment ago. I felt great familiarity with you. And that's because I worked with English people for like way too long. And I worked with them for so long that. I stopped doing the thing where every time I meet an English person, I crack a joke. You know how it goes, you know, like, oh, Americans are so fat because they eat at McDonald's every day. Everybody always says that to me when I'm abroad. Uh, classic one. Well, I I have to confess, when I was a kid and, you know, grew up in London, mom would give us a bus pass and say, go, go and explore London, come back, you know, come back at the late at night. Just mm -hmm. stick together. You and your brother stick together. So we go off for, you know, we're like 10, 12 years old, wandering around London, and we meet, meet um, a lot of American tourists. Uh, and, yeah. 
and they were the caricature you see on television. They really existed. <laughs> and I yeah. thought Americans wore Hawaiian shirts and had, tel had cameras around their necks, you know. <laughs> oh my God, that's hilarious. And here I am. I am we're all America. tourists. I am now an American. It's me. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, you, you wear could. Hawaiian shirts and keep a camera uh, around your neck. I, no. have one, I have one of those shirts. Oh, oh that's funny. <laughs> you oh, should have awesome. wore it. Yeah, it's not a good view where I'm around like people shoot guns and drive big trucks. It's a little bit different <laughs> than uh, your, your touristy types. People around here don't. Uh, well, travel. Steve is in he's in Florida, so it makes sense that it's like oh, Hawaiian, Hawaiian shirts and and, and guns. Cameras. You must want a gun now, Steve. No, 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 no. no. Ah, you're still too no, British. No. I, I was no, I was raised with guns. So that's why I don't have them anymore. Oh, OK. Mm. Well, we don't need to get too far off track. I, I just wanted to ask. Uh, there's so much more we could touch on there. You know, we were talking about some lessons learned, some horror stories, bad things that you've experienced. Um, you also, earlier, you were talking about the certification program that you set up. So there's a lot of ways that this conversation can go. Omid, why don't I touch in with you? Where do you want to take this conversation? Now, I do want to touch on the certification thing either way but Omid what do you think yeah I mean Steve do you feel um all that you know you you talked about what I heard was two primary challenges that you kind of communicated mm -hmm. is there do you want to maybe share one more if there is one more or may, if not then, probably you know we can more. there are I'm sure many lot, many but, but your audience are, are SaaS people so that was a I made some notes here on something yeah so um SaaS is famous. It is known for scalability. Okay. And uh, true, a lot of of uh, the integration technology can, is scalable. But oh, but don't get sucked into thinking that everything's scalable. Oh, um, I like this. Yeah. So, um, so um, you're gonna get more support tickets and and um you're gonna get so um the people your technology is scalable but your people aren't so you know you're gonna get more tickets support tickets you're gonna need more people mm. than you had before okay you can use technology to some degree to fix that um but that that's an issue that um that even in this deepest technology area that you guys work in SAS, that it's still a people issue is mm. integration is still a people issue. Uh, I did his funny story. I did an integration of a company. I can't name names on this one because sure. of, it's, it's a funny story. If it's a good story, I could tell you the name, but I can't this one. No, nah, it's mm. fine. We don't mind if you, if you don't name a name. So I, I was um, hired to this integration. And uh, I was uh, hired officially to do, do the, to do the IT integration. But the senior person came over and said quietly, Steve, you're not actually here to do the IT integration. You're here to be, to be the grown up in the room. You're here to show these people how to behave in business. You're to set an example to them. Mm. Because the owners were, um, childish naive mm. and set bad examples so I said, I said okay i got that okay so a couple of weeks later i was um talking to a guy he was in charge of the uh, the, the network he said i got lunch break coming up soon i'm just gonna reboot the network during my lunch break to save time i go uh, hang on hang on there's a call center downstairs what's going to happen to the call center when you turn the network off ah they won't be able to make any calls, will they? No, they won't. There will be 200 people and they will make phone oh, calls 200. because you're rebooting the network during working hours. Like, oh, oh yeah. Should I do it tonight then? Yes, do it tonight. <laughs> yeah, do it oh tonight. my God. <laughs> yeah. So it's a people, even IT, it's a people thing. Yeah, they, they, mm. they just weren't, they weren't they, that in that environment, they just weren't taught to think besides their screen and their job. They weren't. Sure. And there's, there's all sorts of cultures out there. 
we recently had a SaaS deal close where the sellers were still in their 20s and uh, they still had, a, they were great. We had a good experience with them. So we had some kerfluffles on negotiations as happens uh, to say it lightly. Uh, nonetheless, you know, they were professionals about it and uh, they, they still had room for learning. And so I definitely see what you're saying there. I, I know the feeling. Uh, in tech, you know, you, you, there's definitely more of more of that type of experience than outward, elsewhere. You know, you touched on something really cool about <clears throat> a, a issue that you've seen arise in integration for SaaS businesses. I want to ask and say, hey, for SaaS businesses, is there another big integration issue that you've seen before? Because that's a really good lesson learned. That's right on point for okay. our audience. Um, okay. So a couple of things. One is remember to remove the former owner's access. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, it's a simple thing, but don't forget to do that. Just like you change your bank accounts, checking, uh, who can write checks. Don't forget to close down access to the former owners. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, easy to overlook. It's cause it's such a basic thing. Yeah, common sense is often yeah. foregone. Cross-border SaaS. Mm -hmm. So now you've got GDRP and other things like that. Uh, it, it's a nightmare. I did a, it could be a nightmare, but it has been made easier. It, there, are, is it like there's 18 or 20 different versions of GDRP, an Australian one, Singapore one, America one. Thankfully, I'm not a privacy attorney. It blew my brains out. <laughs> <laughs> If you use one of the big boys to handle it, they will do it for you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I did the seven country uh, integration, uh, China, Germany, Ireland, America, all different regulations. And as long as we use on Microsoft and say which country the person was in, Microsoft applied all the compliance appropriate for us. Mm -hmm. It was a simple thing, fill in the field correctly, and then they will handle it for us. And it was worth every penny. Oh, okay. So when would when would somebody? So that's a great point you're raising. I understand what you're saying. When would somebody? So say somebody is doing a cross border deal. Maybe the target has branches or uh, subsidiaries in multiple foreign countries. Uh, uh, when would somebody do that? It kind of sounds like only if they were using those services, they should keep that in mind. Is kind of what it sounds like. Yeah, really. I'm talking about. Right, uh, domains really, Windows domains, and and which Active Directory and all that sort of stuff. Uh, oh, okay. No, that, that makes sense. sense. Yeah. Okay. And then the you can lean into that. I think OneDrive handles it as well. As long as you label the person correctly in in a domain or their in the network or something. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not a system. Of... Okay. So no, those are two very helpful. No need to for me to to ping down deeper into that. Those are two very helpful additional points that are right on point. Okay. One thing I have not got, uh, not got a good answer for. Yeah. And it's a problem in, in SaaS companies have a lot of remote workers and onboarding is tough mm -hmm. with, with remote people. And I haven't got a good answer yet to that. Um, I'll get back to you on I have, but um, onboarding the, 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 the idea of onboarding is to shorten the learning curve. So okay. how do I work in a new environment? How do I request a new laptop? How do I book, how do I book tickets? Who mm -hmm. can help me? Who knows how to do this thing? Um, so the idea of onboarding is to, is, to, is to shorten the learning curve. It's easier when you're in person than it is remotely. Um, the beauty of in person is that just things come up. Like you bump into somebody in the corridor and you talk about, oh, can you tell me how to get a new laptop? Or who do I, who can help me with this problem I'm having with, with this, you know, whatever, you know, web hook. And, mm. um, you know, and who can help me with the, with the web hooks? And so it's, it, it just happens right there and you, and in person, it's so easy. Um, hey, um, but when you when it's remote, it has to be much more. We know that we know the problems of of connectivity of, of culture, um, and 
um, relationship building when everybody's remote, it is longer than, than it can still be done. We talked about it earlier, but it is an issue which we are as we are all struggling with in in this new uh, post COVID world is is how to how to do onboarding, how to nurture relationships, how to get people productive more, uh, quickly. Um, now we're remote. Mm. That makes sense. I understand where you're coming from there. Well, uh, if you ever do, if you ever find a great app or some way that people do it, feel free to to share it with us, and right. and uh, in the future we could talk about that. Yeah, I get what you're saying there. But mean, were we gonna? Um, we were gonna like take this another direction after we asked for that final like lesson learned from prior bad experience. Where, where, what direction were we gonna take it in? Though I actually flip my mind no worries i mean if if we forgot which direction that's totally okay um i, don't, I was just Steve, asking you. no i don't remember but i have something else queued up oh yeah do it yeah cool steve do people ever come to you like after the integration has gone wrong <laughs> Shit. yes oh okay. no. what's that like like talk, talk to us about that i'm so curious <laughs> there's always a solution but you may not like what it is you may not like it at all but um yes there's always a solution even if it means rebuilding the the widget or rewiring the building um there's there's always a solution and um what's it like you feel like the sky is falling at the time Oh my God! They they put the wrong wire in the building, and we need to rewire it. Um, and you've just got to. Um, you you can't have. You can't have agony over it. You you got you got to like just deal with it, get on with it, create a plan, and actually a careful plan is more accurate. And and get buy in. On how we're going to rewire the building, when we're going to do it, how we're going to make sure everyone's on board, what's going on. So, um, you having a careful plan is um, what's it like? So, what happened? I'm trying to think. Um, what I often get though is uh, whether what I often get no, what, what I often what I often get is, hey Steve, we're closing in three days. We've mm. just realised how big the job is. And now we know we can't do it. We thought we could do it ourselves. Can you come over and help us out? Uh, and with that, and with the, we've already acquired and we're in trouble. It's a case of, um, okay, what have we got? Let's let's do a survey of where we are. Let's get hit. Let's let's do some frank exchanges, and just work at just lay all the pieces, all the digital pieces out on the, on the table first. Um, that that's it's is that it's yeah that's that's a short version of it mm. yeah i mean i what i'm kind of hearing and what i'm really taking away from the conversation about the importance of integration is uh and and i you know there's a question in here as well that i'm kind of going to close with um but care it's so important uh the careful planning um is, is so important in terms of okay you know we understand what your objective is with respect to the acquisition. You know, here's why you're acquiring this business. Okay, so now we're going to set you up. You establish the trust. You build the trust. You make sure that everything stays into place. You identify the pieces that need to be uh, like reconnected or, or connected between the, the two companies, between the target and the acquirer. You almost come up with like a communication plan you know, starting from the, uh, the, the leadership of the acquirer to the target, you even need a communication plan. It sounds like for like middle managers, for example, that are, you know, overseeing these different work streams and how to communicate with their teams that are being integrated, specific tasks, you know, so it's like every aspect of the integration needs to be planned is what I'm hearing. Now, the question is, how do people usually do it? If they don't work with Steve, what is it that they're doing? Um, oh, what do they do? Um, they they have islands of people working um, individually, so they'll they'll have 
uh, hey everyone, we've acquired a company. Can you sort the billing out and can you work out, make a combined sales team? You have islands of, 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 uh, of activity and it, there's a lot of interdependencies in between the different departments, especially IT. Um, and you may have um, legal issues. Sometimes you're legally obliged to wait for something. Um, the obvious one we all know about is a, a healthcare open enrollment. You've got to wait until October, November. Everyone understands that. But there's other things that you guys specialists in. You, you must wait. Um, and things can go off uh, half-cocked. Um, or uh, I mentioned earlier, you, you had to do rework because you've done something out of sequence. Um, the failure rate of M&A is quoted at 70%, 70% failure rate. And most of that is really the integration failing, not so much the deal. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And What's the, do you recall where this, uh, not to cut you off, do you call, recall the source of that data point you got? It's, it's been measured for 50 years. It's pretty much the same number for 50 years. Oh, okay. I was just wondering, like, uh, like a, a, like a source, so that I could just quote it later. <laughs> there are lots of them. Uh, I, I can't oh. think of one to hand. I, I'll maybe see you all afterwards. But uh, um, depending on where you get it from, some say 80, some say 90, some say 70. Let's say 70% failure rate since the 70s when we be measuring the success. Now, most of that is our, our large deals because the data is public. Um, I suspect the the success rate is 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 the success rate is higher with the further down you go, because the complexity dr re dramatically reduces as you have less departments, less cross dependencies, um, less people. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there's a what happens is if without uh, organized planning, you're going to get a failure, failure to achieve an objective. Now, another thing is that M and A success is usually measured by financial in financial terms. Have we achieved revenue or a share price or profitability? But in our industries, with our world, and I'm including you guys, your your your, your listeners, we're acquiring to grow. An objective should not be around finance, but it should be around things that help you grow enables the growth so success might be can we do two product releases in 2024 can we merge the products by october the first mm. can we retain 95 percent of the employees these are these are things that help you grow and those should be your objective these Bring are the back... integration metrics that you were talking about in that like fifth step in terms of that long tail you know are we meeting within this checklist, for example, like those are some of those kind of like checklist items is what I'm hearing. Is that right? Yes, they're delivered then. But, but you before you start, you say, we will plant a flag and say success is when we've done two releases in one mm. year. Mm. So before you start, you say what success is. Uh, so you can say, yes, we've done it or no, we haven't. Instead of saying, oh, we're going to grow the business. No, we're going to two releases within a year. Um, so that's that's where you plant the flag. Uh, then you can achieve success more, more easily. And if you don't have someone organizing your integrations, you're not going to have a measure of success defined. And you're probably going to, if you do have one, you're not going to achieve it, is the answer. Um, mm. I love how we've touched on, from a very high level overview, though, your process. Uh, and the, the five steps and stuff. And you had also talked about, hey, you you know, ultimately everything came together in this instruction manual, manual or this, you know, this uh, teaching uh, methodology with your certified course or courses. Yes. You know, why don't, I have a for, first question about that. Who typically is the type of person that takes that course? Is it, right. are it those people on those islands? Who is it? So the certification program, thank you for mentioning that. So yeah. we we do advisory services. We help people deliver integrations. We also, we teach, we train people and certify them as a certified acquisition integration managers or 
C A I M Kane. Okay. And we have uh, we have three audiences. The first are acquirers, usually serial acquirers, who do integrations but just aren't that good at it or want to improve. The first audience are strategics. Uh, uh, the first audience are serial acquirers who want to get better at integrating. They already have a team who, who will integrate um, and they're doing okay, but they want to get more out of the integrations. The second are eminent advisors, accountants, CPAs, advisors themselves, investment bankers who want to deliver a better service to their clients, lawyers perhaps, who, <laughs> who okay. want to, because the, by understanding integration, they can help prepare their clients for what's ahead, whether they're buy side or sell side. Uh, uh, or, uh, and so they can help give a, better, give a better valuation or help them get a make sure they get a seat at the table if they're on the sell side. Um, so knowing about integrations helps deal makers. You know, that, that makes sense completely. So I'm hearing lawyers, investment bankers, people on the strategic team, if, if it's a serial acquirer, for example, that makes a lot of sense. Do you, do you, for the most part, do you market or target those services at any one of those groups? Is there, is there a fair mix between them? How does it, how does it usually work, uh, work out? Um, or right. How is it working out right now? It's working out. Yeah. It's, it's, it's growing. It's, it's um, I had to, um, so I market it to a lot of advisors and I end up getting strategics mostly um, and advisors. I also get consultants who, who, oh. are, who do integration and want to either improve their skills or some credibility with the certification program too. Uh, but mostly I get advisors. I'm trying to think of my current class who's in it. Um, can't think who is it. So, um, mm. No, that's fine. I was just trying to get an understanding there if it was mostly like people in strategics or mostly advisors. Uh, not that it particularly matters. I just wanted to understand more about what you're doing because I, I really like what you're doing. It's not one of those things that people go to get an MBA for watch. It is. I, it, it, I wasn't aware of such a thing at my time. That's that's how I'll state that fact. Um, but I really like what you're doing there. It definitely is a vital part of the process. And it is something that, as we discussed earlier, isn't necessarily the first thing people think of when they think I want to or am going to go buy a business. Um, really? And I guess a big reason why I have harped on integration in the past is I've seen really great advisors and great acquirers mess it up. And so even the best... Uh, in the market aren't necessarily uh, performing at the peak that they could perform at if they learned a little bit more, became a little bit better at integration, such as by obtaining a certification, learning about it from you. So that's very helpful to learn a little bit more about what you're doing. And so to get in touch with you regarding the certification, mm -hmm. would people also reach you at your consultancy website? Yes, so intista.com intista.com slash came c-a-i-m you'll find out about it yeah okay great. great that's where people can reach you and i i would even go so far as to say you know we work with a lot of first-time buyers who might not necessarily have deal like multiple staff or anything maybe it's like family wealth that they are deciding to start use in private equity but don't have a private equity team or anything and I would even go so far as to say that those people should go take a look at your program, whether they have operational expertise and experience or not. I can definitely see it being just a, 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 a something that could really fill out their learning. And I definitely moving forward will tell people to go check that out when we're on the subject of integration. So mm -hmm. I appreciate what you are doing and have done, and I think it's super useful across the industry for various uh, players from from uh, wherever people are operating. Thank you. Yeah, I, I people say to me, "Why are you training your competitors?" I said, "Well, well, 
um, actually, there's plenty of work out there. Um, we uh, uh, a, a common problem that our industry has in integration in post mode integration is not being remembered. That people say, "Oh, I get so many conversations saying, oh, you're so valuable.' It's it's surprising. It's um, so interesting. I'm in a crusade in a way. I'm trying to r remind people that integrations is important and it, it it needs work to be successful you can't muddle through it um that's why the failure rate is so high steve give us a tip of the day real quick tip of the day okay for integration you is when you get down to running the projects it's a, a kind of project management type of exercise never use excel to track your projects Always use a mm. cloud-based system. Mm. Um, never, you don't want one person to be running that. Um, and so, ne so never use Excel. Excel is great for templates. But once you get started, use something in the cloud. One source of truth. Mm. So people that. do devs and forgetting things. I got another one now. You can choose the best one. Okay, hit us, hit us, okay. hit us. <laughs> uh, tip of the day. So every week uh, during integrations, when you're actually running the projects, you're going to have a status meeting. And uh, there's a lot of people can be in meetings. You could have, you know, 10 department, 10 work streams with two people from each. There's a lot of hours getting burned. So to keep them on the track, you run this meeting, get it all done in one hour. What I say is I want to, all the status in, on my desk before the meeting begins. And all I want you to do is talk to each other about what you need from other people in the room i i don't want to hear why you're late what you've achieved that's already written down i need to know you need you to talk to each other you get two minutes to tell us what you want from anybody else in the room and then you have unlimited time for questions to you from the other people in the room and you get the meeting done in one hour oh that's really cool i like that that's cool that's well, sweet. well let's steve that. yeah let's yeah, I'll go ahead and close this out. Um, Steve, it's been a real pleasure having you on uh, on the show. Thanks for joining us this week uh, on the SaaS Buyers Club podcast. I'm your host, Omid. And I was co-host, Joe. And I'm Steve Long from Intista.